All right. Um, next slide. I'll get us started because I want to make sure we have enough time. Hello, my name is Terry Camacho Gonzalez, and I am director of the Traumatic Brain Injury Technical Assistance and Resource Center. Thank you, thank you for joining us to learn about keeping the passion alive, getting and staying involved in the brain injury community. This webinar is sponsored by the Traumatic Brain Injury Technical Assistance and Resource Center, also known as the TBI TARC, which is funded by the Administration for Community Living. The TBI TARC is administered by the Human Services Research Institute, HSRI, where I work, with the assistance of the National Association of State Head Injury Administrators, NASHA. This webinar is free and open to the public. Next slide. A few logistics before we get going. Participants will be in listen-only mode during the webinar, so please use the chat feature in Zoom to post questions and communicate with the hosts. Um, we are going to try to see if we can get questions um, at the end of each section, but most likely we'll just we'll monitor the chat, but we'll end up just doing questions and answers at the end of the of the webinar to give to give a chance for us to hear all the great speakers we have today. This webinar will be live captioned in English and live interpreted in Spanish. Live English captions can be assessed by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Live Spanish interpretation can be accessed by clicking the interpretation button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You will see a, a, a world icon. So you hit that um, to access the Spanish captions, you select the Spanish channel. Once you are in the Spanish channel, please silence the original audio so that you only hear it in Spanish. Se puede acceder a la interpretación en español en vivo haciendo clic en el botón Interpretation en la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom, icono del mundo. Para acceder a los subtítulos en español, por favor, elija el canal en español. Una vez el canal Una vez en el canal español, por favor, silencie el audio original. This live webinar includes polls and evaluation questions. Please be prepared to interact during polling times. Next slide. Feedback and follow-up. After the webinar, you can send follow-up questions and feedback to tbitark at sign hsri.org. Please note that this email address will not be monitored during the webinar. A recording, including a PDF version of the slides, will be available on the ACL website, acl.gov. Um, Shaska has also put into the chat a link where you can actually get access to the PDF right now of the slides if you desire. Next slide. We want to start off with a polling question. We want to know who's here. This is very helpful for the speakers to know who they're talking to. So our first question is, in what roles do you self-identify? And you can select all that apply. Um, so go ahead and select um, whatever roles you identify. And we'll give, you, we'll give people a few seconds. And then we'll, close the, we'll end the poll. We have, I'll just give it a little while more since we have like 234 people logged on, 235. All right. Um, ooh, still going. I don't know if I should end it. All right, I'm gonna end it. So um, it, it looks like, um, which is great. We have a good representation of people here. We have 20% um, are people with a traumatic brain injury or other disability. And then we have representations from service provider organizations, social workers, counselors, clinicians, and other. Thank you so much. This is helpful for us to know who is here. Um, next slide, please. Oh, I never shared this. So um, just real brief. Um, I'm going to introduce the speakers and moderators. Um, we are going to be starting off with Maria Crawley and Judy Detmer, who are our technical assistance leads for the TBI TARC, the Traumatic Brain Injury Technical Assistance and Resource Center. And they also work with our partner at NASHA. Next slide, please. 
And then um, I'm really pleased to have four members. The TBI TARC has um, a traumatic brain injury advisory and leadership group, the TAL group, um, and four members are speaking today. And they are Carol Starr, Cheryl Kempf, Clifford Heimowitz, and Kelly Lang. Um, they are all um, survivors, and Kelly is a caregiver, um, and they've had experience being advisory board members, advocates, and very involved in the community, and their full bios are at the end. Um, so you can read a little more about them. Next slide. And now I want to get us started. Section one is um, introduction and purpose, and my colleagues Maria Crawley and Judy Detmer will be um, doing this section and Maria will be starting us off. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Terry. Uh, my colleague Judy Detmer and I are going to um, just provide you with a brief um, introduction to what we're gonna be covering in today's webinar. Next slide. We are going to start with some brief introductions to the Administration for Community Living Program. Uh, to the Traumatic Brain Injury State Partnership Program and grants themselves, a little bit about advisory boards within each state program, and then an introduction to today's webinar. Next slide. So a little bit about ACL and its mission, which, as you can see, maximizes the independence, well-being, and health of older adults, people with disabilities across the lifespan, and their families and caregivers. Their vision is for all people, regardless of age and disability, to live with dignity, make their own choices, and participate fully in society. Next slide. And here is the overall purpose of the Traumatic Brain Injury State Partnership Program, or SPP, as you will see in the logo. The purpose is to create and strengthen person-centered, culturally competent systems of services and supports that maximize the independence and overall health and well-being of people with traumatic brain injury across the lifespan and the people who support them. So as you can see at the center are individuals with traumatic brain injury and we like to honor that as much as we can. Next slide. Here are the overall goals for the grantees and I'm not going to read through each of these but just emphasize a few points. The goals involve evidence-based services and supports, collaboration and coordination, opportunities for everyone who may have a traumatic brain injury to have meaningful participation, data collection, and looking at program impact and effectiveness of those services and supports. Next slide. There are currently 28 Traumatic Brain Injury State Partnership Program grantees, and you can see them listed here on the slide. The ones in orange are the states that were funded in the previous cycle, and then the two states in yellow are those states that were added in this existing cycle, which is a five-year cycle and will end in 2026. And next slide. Great, thank you, Maria. So my name is Judy Detmer and I am wearing a black shirt. I have short hair and I wear glasses and I have some old uh, kind of posters, vintage posters behind me. Um, I'm just gonna talk a little bit more about the SPP grantee uh, program in terms of what the responsibilities are of the grantees. So each grantee would have a state advisory board, and we'll talk more about that as opportunities for engagement. Um, each state will develop a state TBI plan. They'll conduct TBI resource facilitation. Each state is involved in a minimum of two uh, work groups that have been designated by the Administration for Community Living on special topic areas, such as um, underserved populations, advisory boards and uh, councils, um, kind of drawing a blank. Anyway, there's a uh, nine different work groups, so it's hard to remember them all, but each uh, grantee is involved in two of those. Sustainability is a key to these uh, grants. They are meant to be infrastructure capacity building grants, so I'm hoping that states can sustain the efforts beyond the grant funding. 
All the grantees attend grantee meetings, and uh, one of those happens in March, typically. It's our TBI Stakeholder Day meeting, and um, it'll be something that you all are welcome to attend as well. Data collection is a focus for uh, ACL and performance reporting so that we can ensure that the dollars that are being spent are having an effect in the state set um, and improving outcomes for people with brain injury. And then the, each state has optional activities that they can engage in uh, working with special populations or something of that nature. And then finally, ACL has a strong emphasis on um, ensuring accessibility, as Maria mentioned. And so the grantees are working on 508 compliance with the documents and resources that they create. Next slide. So uh, this slide has a lot of information. And, and as Maria said earlier, I'm not gonna read all of this, but um, you will have it. You have access to the slides, but we did wanna set the stage for the TBI advisory board requirement. So the goal with the advisory board is to ensure that there's a variety of stakeholders um, and input from individuals with TBI, their families and support systems to help create structure for statewide cross systems collaboration and to develop that infrastructure to support people with brain injuries in their state. There are requirements for the advisory board that are outlined in the law, the public law that created this program. And then ACL has furthered some of the requirements, um, staying in tune with their commitment for being person-centered and ensuring the voice of someone uh, with brain injury is at the table. And so they have included that membership of the advisory board needs to be at least 50% people with brain injury, with their lived experience with brain injury. In addition, there should be family members with brain injury, uh, people with brain injury, centers for independent living, aging and disability resource centers, protection and advocacy, long-term care ombudsman, NIDLER, uh, and that's the National Institute on Disability and Independent Living Rehabilitation Research, which is also part of ACL, um, their funded TBI model system representation. So you can see that the advisory boards have a diverse representation. Next slide. In addition, states have many other ways that people can become involved, and you'll be hearing about that next with our, our members, um, but there's advocacy organizations, there's coalitions, a lot of states have brain injury trust fund boards, um, support groups, or peer support advisories. So you'll hear about all of those coming up, but we want to encourage you to think broadly about how you can become engaged in brain injury in your state. Next slide. So today's webinar will focus in on the readiness um, to engage, opportunities for engagement, places and events to engage in, how to graduate um, and support in leading others, um, if that's a desire that you have, and how to even find the opportunities in the first place about how to engage. And then lastly, talking about strategies for staying engaged. Next slide. With that, I'm excited to turn this over now to Carol Starr and Cheryl Kemp, who will be talking about readiness to engage and engagement. Hi, everybody. I am Carol Starr. And um, next slide, please. And if you, um, I'm a brain injury survivor, and I am a middle-aged woman, white middle-aged woman uh, with brownish blonde hair, and I am wearing a black sweater today. And I'm honored to get this started talking about readiness to engage. And even before I start talking about that, I wanna reference the title of this workshop, which is Keeping the Passion Alive. And I think as brain injury survivors, as we think about what our lives are like after brain injury, finding a way to have passion is such an important piece that for so many of us, brain injury takes away who we once were. Before my own injury back in 1999, I was a teacher, I was a musician. I had passion for those things. I can't do either of those things anymore. I had to find a new way to be engaged in life. And for me, one of those ways that I found passion was through becoming involved in the brain injury community, through using what I've been through to help other people. And that's what this, this webinar is all about is, first, if you're a survivor, 
finding ways that you can be involved. If you're a program staff or a community, a community provider, finding ways that you can help brain injury survivors to become more involved. Because as I, as I said, you know, brain injury, it does change our lives so immensely. It doesn't leave any part of it untouched. We do have to reinvent ourselves. And as we find ways to give back to the community, it's, it's, I think it's so important because our experiences, they, they have weight, they have a, a, a meaning that like nobody else's because we are living this every single day. It has been an honor and a privilege for me to use my experience to help others. But I will say with all honesty, it is not always easy. Being an advocate and a mentor and an author and a speaker, it can be draining. There are times, I mean, yesterday was an example. I did some stuff in the morning and my brain was done. I was on the couch the rest of the day. Sometimes it can be overwhelming. It can be confusing. At times it can feel like, what have I gotten myself into? This is a lot for my injured brain. And I say all that because this role, it has to be something that we're ready for. Because when we are ready to pay it forward, the challenging parts, they're still there. Yes, yesterday was a challenging day for my brain, but the rewarding parts are still there because what I was doing was going to be helping other people. And I think it's the exact opposite. If we engage before we're ready, if we engage too early in our journey, when we're still trying to figure out brain injury, then that challenge becomes too all-encompassing. For example, early on in my journey, I could have taken yesterday and, and been really upset. You know, the old Carol, she could have you know, gone to a meeting and not been overwhelmed by that at all. New Carol got a little overwhelmed. I don't like it anymore, but it is part of my new reality that I now accept and I can move forward with it. What I've learned in my 23 years as a survivor is that there is a process to becoming a brain injury advocate, being in, involved in this community, that none of us just springs fully formed doing all of these different roles, that we kind of grow up in this process. So both Cheryl and I are gonna talk a little bit about that. So I wanna talk about things from both a survivor point of view, as well as a program staff and community um, provider point of view. Some of the things to think about as you want um, to get involved. Um, next slide, please. So these are questions. If you're a brain injury survivor, to ask yourself. If you're a program staff or community provider, to ask of the person that you're, you're thinking about involving more. To think about where is this person in their journey? Are they learning to cope or are they ready to pay it forward? I really think that we have to be ready for this, that the early years of brain injury are really spent getting used to this injury, figuring out who are we now? How do we learn how to live with this? Coming to acceptance, coming to, to some feeling of being okay with our new selves, that until we have gotten to a point, a point, that point in our injury, it's hard to, to be able to pay it forward. Um, so I think that's an important question to ask yourself as you're, you're, you're moving forward. Next slide, please. Another important question as you're going on your journey forward is, have you regularly attended anything? Um, do you have any kind of, of history of going to, to meetings such as, such as, as a support group? A lot of boards, they have a regular meeting. And if you've gone to a support, somebody's gone to a support group, that gives you an, an idea that somebody has the ability to, to attend regular meetings. Next slide. This is a really important one. I know early on in my journey, I could not talk about my brain injury and everything, all of the changes in my life without just bursting into tears because all of the losses, they were so fresh. And I needed to go through that crying phase. Um, but that doesn't really help somebody else, that I needed to be able to work through that piece and then be able to help others. So when you're assessing whether you're ready to, to help others or whether somebody else is ready to help others, to ask, you know, how is the, to, to, to judge, how is that person able to tell their story? 
Um, and why are they telling their story? That I'm also a support group leader and there is a beautiful time in, in leading a support group when you can tell the difference in somebody when they're telling their story because they need to tell it for themselves because they are still working it out for, for their journey. They're, they're, they're getting through their grief. But then there comes a time when they're not really telling it for themselves anymore. They're starting to tell it for other people for other people because what they've been through, whatever story they're telling, is going to help somebody else. That's when somebody is ready for engagement, for more involvement in the brain injury community. Next slide, please. You know, as we all get involved in the brain injury community, it doesn't mean we still don't have brain injuries. We still do. And we're going to need to have strategies to manage our symptoms. You know, I had a tough day yesterday. My strategy was time on the couch. That's what I needed, that, that I only schedule one thing in the day because I knew that that was gonna be a little bit challenging. And so I didn't schedule anything else. I need, because I also, I knew that I had today. Um, so asking a person, do you have strategies to manage your brain injury symptoms? Um, so because sometimes as we all know, Brain injuries come out whether we want them to or not. And that's okay because it is what it is, but we do need those strategies. Uh, next slide. And do we know what accommodations we need to be successful? Do we know that we need, um, when, when we need a meeting to be, that we need help getting there, we need um, reminders, what, kind, what, what do we need to do to be successful? Those, when we, when we have, when, then we're ready to be more involved. So those are some of the, the ways that one can judge whether one is involved, one is re ready to be involved, more involved in the brain injury community. So now Cheryl is going to take over and she's gonna talk at a, a different level about what is really possible for a brain injury survivor to do that that sometimes we think that one person can't make a difference, that what's the point of getting involved? I can't do anything, I'm just one person. Cheryl's gonna show us that one person really can make a difference. So take it away, Cheryl. Thank you, Carol, I appreciate that. Two weeks ago, the president signed into law, public law 117-170, also known as HR 2992, or the PTSD and TBI and PTSD Law Enforcement Training Act. That began with my bad night on the road in 2012, when I had finished chairing the Traumatic Brain Injury Advisory Council, which was an advisory council to the Texas Health and Human Services Commission, and I was driving home. I was pulled over by a county sheriff. My brain injury stems from 1994, my PTSD began that night and my hand and foot are numb on my right side. As I handed him my driver's license, I dropped it. And I carry a brain injury. I ID card in my purse with my husband's name and phone number on it. He told me that dropping anything was a sign of intoxication. I got beaten very badly and got to spend the night in jail. There was never any proof of anything. They have the video of the driving and the whole bit. Um, that began a very hard night, very dark time. By 2000, that was July 13th of 2012. By 2014, the case was still open. Hayes County, which is a county in central Texas, kept changing prosecutors and they would not drop the charges though there was no proof. So we changed tactics and we decided that I needed to quote, win bigger than the courtroom. So to do that, you cannot discuss an open case. So I had not presented this to the Brain Injury Advisory Council. I had no support group around me. So I pled guilty. And I will tell you that one of the hardest moments of this past 10 years was when that gavel fell. And I put myself at the mercy of the system that had put me in jail and wouldn't drop these charges. So I had to do that so I could talk about the case. When they sentenced me to probation, that also allowed me to say anything. And I asked the judge, I said, you cannot do anything to me anymore. And he said, no. The next day I was in state representative Elliot Neshtat's office. That was September 
7th of 2014. We had a legislative session beginning in January. Our legislature meets every two years for six months from January through May or sometimes into June. I gave Elliot all the stuff and asked him to carry a law to prevent that from happening, explaining my night, which he did. I testified to the legislature through the committee for special projects for law enforcement. The chair of that committee was Alan Fletcher, a conservative Republican from Houston. Elliot was the liberal Democrat who has now retired. He was Dean of the House. When I finished speaking to that committee, which is on video, you can watch it on the Texas Legislative Archive website. Alan leaned forward in his chair and he said, I am so very sorry for your night. I knew at that moment that we had a law because I had a liberal Democrat and a conservative Republican and we passed the house with maybe three votes and abstentions against it. The Senate passed, Texas Senate passed it unanimously in May of that year. The governor signed it into law on June 17th of 2015. And that began my journey forward. In 2016, I was working at Wells Fargo and somebody asked me what I was doing. This was my first job after all this had happened. My licenses and my character had been threatened. I have two licenses. I'm a CPA and a fraud investigator. So I looked at this lady and I said, I'm beginning again. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, and I gave her this long story. I ended up speaking at the Wells Fargo International Diversity and Inclusion webinar and they are worldwide. So it was seen by a lot of people. One of the people that saw me had a family member that worked for Congressman Will Hurd. He called his family member and he said, you need to hear this story. So that year, that was actually 2017, I was invited to come to Washington to Congressman Hurd's office in June of that year, which I did go. I met with Congressman Hurd's office and in the other four hours of my day, I contacted Congressman Pascrell's office because he chairs the Committee on Brain Injury. I met with both those people and the next year I began my journeys to Washington, both as an individual, as Brain Injury Association of America with their Hill Days, but I never quit speaking as an individual. That fall, we thought we would have a law, but politics got in the way. In 2020, I spoke as part of the panel to the congressional briefing panel on Hill Day about this night and about this law. And they passed, it was then HR 6008. It did not pass that session. In May of 2021, Congressman Pascrell reintroduced the bill as HR 2992, which is now law. That passed in July of this year or June of this year, passed the House. The Senate passed it in early August of this year. And as I said, they then sent it to the president and he has now signed it into law. It has been a very long journey. It's been 10 years, one month and three days since that happened, that they passed that law when he signed it on August 16th. The advocacy came from one step at a time. To go back to Carol's stuff, I knew Representative Neshtat well enough to know he would not think I would have done that. The other opportunities as a self-advocate with no support was simply one opportunity at a time. Anytime I could speak, I did. I covered, I put 70,000 miles on my car that year doing my own advocacy for that law, the Texas state law, which is H House Bill 1338 in the state that passed. The veterans picked it up to support it and it began to roll out into, into the communities. There were three parts. It now belongs to T. Cole in April of 2000. 21, T. Cole took over Texas the Commission on Law Enforcement for the training. The training was written by the Office of Acquired Brain Injury with the Texas Human Services Commission. As that law has come together, part of my journey was every single time I had an opportunity, I took it. I would talk to any person that would listen. When I would go to Washington in the Capitol, I carried cards, like photo cards that you make from Walmart that aren't easy to throw away because you have to notice them. And I would watch for the different legislators. Every time I went, I had a visit list and I would get in the elevator with a legislator that I was looking for. And I would say, hi, I'm Cheryl, I'm from Texas. And today to be different is not to be guilty. Do you have a moment to hear about that? 
when you're when session is in, you have maybe a minute to get their interest or their attention. But by speaking to the politicians or speaking to their legislative directors in their offices, I started to get the support and attention. In 2018, I first met Senator Cruz at a coffee. I've then since visited his office every year I've been in Washington and I've been in every Washington year in Washington every year since 2017 often on my own because you can't allow other people to speak through you. you have to do your own stuff when the president signed the law two weeks ago that was just the biggest best moment I said when I was finished with this law we would have protection in every one of the 50 states and we now have it for things like that to recognize the symptoms and what the law basically does is it require identification of the symptoms of TBI or PTSD and constructive response to that. So on the brain injury ID card that I carry that the officer refused to look at is a list of things to not do. Don't yell at the individual. Keep your voice low, back away, call an ambulance. Well, they did call an ambulance that night, but the EMS driver told the sheriff that there's no way brain injury from 1994 could affect a life in 2012, which is wrong. So that's why they need to educate everybody, all the first responders. And now we have that law and that's a really good thing. It's been very recent. So I don't know yet how that will roll out in every state. Each state kind of has their own delivery system, but I'm very excited and Texas has been very excited to, to look at that with me. So that's what I have to say. My personal website is cherylswords.com. It's very hard to get 10 years into 10 minutes, but I think it's really important that we all support that. And that came, I will say, I did not do this. While I did all the contact on my own, I've had the support of NASHA and the Brain Injury Association of America. I got a humanitarian award in 2016 from the Brain Injury Alliance. Um, it's been, as it snow became, the, the little thing that became the snowball and more and more people supported it. That's been a wonderful thing. And it was when I, in 2019, when I spoke at the Brain Injury Association of Virginia, I used my other day of that visit to go up to the Hill. And that's where I met again with Congressman Pascrell's office and really got their attention and got it going. And that, again, from 2020, I flew home in 2020, the night that COVID hit the Capitol. I did not go anywhere in 2021. I did speak on advocacy, 10 points of advocacy for NASHA. This year I'm doing, I always try to speak, but this year I also tried, I did not sign up to speak anywhere. I wanted to hear what I, hear what else was out there. And the response back was, where have you been? So I was still advocating the week that the law passed. I still did not know. I was in touch with my two senators and with the senator from Georgia who sponsored this bill in the Senate to make sure that all that grassroots stuff was still happening. Anybody that would listen, I would speak to. So. Thank you very much. And I'm introducing section three, which is Cliff, Carol, and then I will wrap it up with opportunities to engage. Trying to stop. Cliff, are Hello? you there? Yep, oh, there I am. Hello, thank you very much. Um, my name is Cliff Heimowitz. I'm a older gentleman with gray hair, glasses, um, wearing a white shirt with blue and red stripes. Um, I want to preface by saying that I'm from New York State. And so my experiences that I'm going to talk about are relevant to what's happening in New York State. Whether you live in New York State a lot or not, I hope you could identify with what I'm talking about and maybe you can start your own journey in grassroots efforts. Next slide. I acquired my head injury in my early 40s. I'm now in my 60s. And when I had my accident, um, I wasn't diagnosed originally because there was no talk about traumatic brain, traumatic brain injury back then. And so we, we struggled to find services and wanted to get diagnosed. And so I went to a physiatrist. My children's mother brought me to a physiatrist where I was diagnosed as having a traumatic brain injury. At that time, I joined the community reentry program at a local hospital called St. Charles, which is in Port Jefferson, New York. 
it was a group that really started stroke survivors, but they incorporated people with traumatic brain injury. And without that, I don't know if I'd be where I am today. I actually had to relearn how to walk, talk, everything. And so I wanted to find out where is, who is part of my TBI community where I live? Um, when I graduated from the community entry program, I went to an organization with my children's mother to see if there was any service they could provide me. And they basically told me that since I wasn't eligible for their day program, then there was nothing they could provide me. And they were the sole provider of the traumatic brain injury waiver, which is in New York State. Thankfully, he's gone now and the organization moved on and there's different people running it. So how do I find people in the TBI community to connect with? Well, I'm a mental health peer specialist. And so I work with people with mental health issues. And I often like, identify myself as being a head injury survivor. And I explain to them the symptoms that I, that I experienced, or they share with me the experiences they have. And I say, you know, have you ever looked at or got diagnosed for having a head injury? And so people really started to get to know me um, because I self-identify. So how did I begin a grassroots effort? Well, I was on the waiver and I wasn't getting the services I needed. So my sister, who was an advocate at the time, reached out to New York State and she got me in touch with the woman who is my, my mentor and everything. Her name is Mary Beth Ganazio. And she's the administrator for the TBI waiver in New York State. And she got me involved by telling me that the CMS was reevaluating our waiver and there were certain things that had to get changed. And so they had meetings held in Albany and she encouraged me to come up there. And I would go and I would listen and listen and listen. And then finally, I started to speak up. And I realized that I was the only one in the room that was experiencing as a survivor, everybody else were providers. And that's when I realized that I had to start my grassroots effort. And what that included was, is sharing my story, as Carol mentioned, and people identifying with it and want information. And I wanted to give a shout out to Brian, who's on this webinar. Brian's a perfect example. I didn't know Brian at all, but a friend of mine told me, oh, I saw this on our Facebook page that doing a fundraiser for a TBI organization. I'm like, TBI organization? I'm surprised I don't know about them. So I went and I met Brian and now he's on the webinar. He has his own foundation and I look forward to working with him because that's another way to reach out to the grassroots, get involved with these community groups and find out who's involved with them. Through my, uh, my education as a mental health peer specialist, I learned about the asset-based community development, ABC. Okay, and this is an approach that offers a sustainable model of development, one that prioritizes a grassroots bottom up approach of empowering inclusive and trans transformation changed communities. This approach seeks to identify the already existing skills, services, and assets that exist at the local level and mobilize them to better serve the community as a whole. ABC emphasizes relation build, relationship building which is the key to increasing social capital within the community. It's all about relationships. And you'll hear more about those as we go along. So thank you very much. And the next slide is gonna be, um, my apologies, um, is Cheryl talking about engaging in state advice words. Take it away, Cal, I'm um, Cheryl, sorry. Actually, it's me. I'm gonna talk about support groups. <laughs> I'm back again. I am honored to get to talk about support groups as an opportunity, both for brain injury survivors in terms of engagement, but also for program staff and community, survive, and community providers in terms of a place to find survivors who are ready for engagement. I think my path through brain injury would have been so different if I had not found a support group. Actually, I, it, took two, it took finding two support groups. I went to one support group and it was a room full of people crying and I left and I never went back to that particular one because at that point I could barely handle my own emotions and I could not handle the, just, it was, it was a negative place. Eventually through um, brain injury rehab, uh, one of my therapists brought me to um, a support group there and it was a much more positive place 
where yes, we talk about hard things, but with a, po with a more positive focus, with a strategy-based focus. Um, I'm actually now the leader of that particular support group. And my journey to becoming an, an advocate, a mentor, a speaker, an author, runs right through that support group, through everything that I learned there. So support groups, I think, are, are unsung heroes in terms of, of helping us to, to develop skills, to find opportunities. That if you're a brain injury survivor, if you, when you attend a support group, it is a place to learn how to tell your story, that generally you, you do introductions. And that's how you learn, well, how much of my story do I tell? Because usually there's not room for the entire thing that we learn, how do I tell small chunks of it? If somebody else is having a hard time, maybe there's only a small piece of my story that I need to tell. And we, we can get better at, at doing that. Support groups are a place to learn mentoring, to learn how do I use my story to help other people? How do I, how can I be there for somebody else? Support groups are an opportunity to volunteer, that a lot of support groups are run by volunteers. I'm a volunteer support group leader, that we often, we need help from other people. And that is an opportunity for people to volunteer, to, um, you know, to, to set up chairs, to, to talk to new members, um, to, to be there in whatever kinds of, of ways um, are necessary. So those are all ways that, that as survivors, uh, we can grow through, through a support group. Um, support groups will sometimes do, can sometimes do fundraisers. They do presentations. They might do social um, outings. All of these things are ways to grow. For program staff and community providers, support groups are a place to find survivors who are ready for a level of, of engagement. I mentioned in my first presentation how there's that, that beautiful time when survivors go from telling their story for themselves to telling it for, for others. I will tell you that any support group leader worth their salt can tell you exactly who those people are in your group. If I think about my group, I know exactly who those people are. I know who, who would potentially be ready for, for more because they have made that transition. So I encourage you to, to get to know the support group leaders within your state because they're a resource for you. I know that you know, finding survivors who want to, to join boards is, is a big um, issue with the 50% rule for, um, for survivor um, membership on boards. So I think support group leaders are, are a place that you can, um, you can access. So how do you find out about support groups if you're if, if you a survivor? Um, I would recommend going to your state um, association or alliance. A lot of them have listings um, there. Local hospitals sometimes will run these support groups. Maybe you live in an area where there's not an in-person support group that you can access easily. One of the silver linings of the pandemic has been Zoom, here we all are, um, has been virtual. So there are, there are virtual support groups out there. There are resources on, on social media now. There are, so, there are um, for support groups. So there are numerous ways that you can connect with other brain injury survivors, because I really think that this is a first opportunity to, to get involved. And because once you get involved in one thing, it can, it can grow and you never know how one small, piece of engagement can grow into something big. For 12 years, I led a group called Brain Injury Voices. We grew out of, out, out of a support group. In, in 12 years together, we volunteered 12,000 hours. That, and all that grew out of a support group. So a tremendous difference can be made there. So Cheryl's gonna talk now about the potential for getting involved in advisory boards. Hi again, everybody. Um, I'm sorry I didn't say what I look like earlier. I have very short brown hair. I'm middle-aged and I'm, today I'm wearing a black shirt with gold stripes on it. So before 
I got involved with the law. I was chair of the Traumatic Brain Injury Advisory Council, as I said before, for the state of Texas. I did have to resign that position to pursue advocating for the law because as chair of the board, I could only speak to the, to the state for what they needed to do. And as an individual, I can say anything I want. So they learned about my incident the same day as I resigned in October of 2014 as chair because of the session coming up in 2015. But while I was chair, I was chair for about four years. Uh, these are some of the things I did. I became chair in 2010 and I had been a brain injury survivor since 1994. So a lot of my stuff had been kind of self-invented at home and I really didn't have a support group. Once I met the, the chair of the council, I began to be involved with them and that was a lot of help. It was wonderful to find a community to be part of. Um, most states have a brain injury advisory council. They differ in form and times they meet by state. We met every quarter and we're supposed to work in between. We had committees that supported us. Um, councils are comprised of people that are survivors with lived experience, family members, caregivers, or a program and agency staff. Membership is often by a specific background and you're appointed to the committee by the executive commissioner or by the governor, depending on the way your state is set up. There are opportunities to engage for survivors, program or agency staff, family members and caregivers. Nomination is made. Um, and again, it de depends on the background and the background check in your interview and then you're appointed or asked to apply again at a different time. The council works at the national level too, uh, meets with some of the groups and they're involved in the legislation that they, we do, we watch the state. In our case, we had a really good handle with the legislature and spent a, an amount of time on the grounds, but you have a very specific way you can speak for, but you can't lobby. You can inform about, but you can lobby about a need and, and see if you can get there here and support it. The councils also have committees whose job is to research and do the work to support the council and their business in between meetings. Um, they're a good way to learn the work of the council without a formal appointment to the council because sometimes you have to wait on that. That's how I first began with the council. I began going to committee meetings by invitation and listening and then helping with some of the work. Um, sample councils might be legislative and policy, which is what I got very familiar with after the fact. Nominations where you keep a file of good prospective members if you need anything. Education where you go out like I did into the schools and veteran groups and talk about the council and invite people to come. And we have a big veterans hospital in Waco, Texas, which is north of Austin. So going, traveling a little bit to get what we did at the meetings out into the state, which in our case takes a lot because we have a lot of ground to cover. Awareness and outreach, what are the needs? What are we moving into the community? As I began to speak for the state and people learned about my background, I began to do some things for some of the other disability groups. I worked for the Department of Assistive and Rehabilitative Services, and I was asked to speak to people that were sight impaired or mentally had mental health issues, things like that. Because as everybody said, isolation, which I had experienced in the 15 years between my brain injury and learning about the council, I had, it's a lonely time. Carol's right about that. It gets difficult to keep going at times. So you want to kind of get familiar with what your strengths are. I got to where I wasn't uncomfortable to speak about things. And I think the more I learned about people, the more people started to come to meetings and we began to get a really good audience to come. And I would actually take a break and go down and talk to the attendees and see why we're there and what why they were there and what they needed. And I would put my phone number out anywhere. So I got a lot of phone calls. I still have the same phone number as a matter of fact, in case anybody needs to find me. Services and supports, how can you help some of the support groups or other things from the state agency? They had at that time, a lot of literature that they could pass out. They produced a CD on people with brain injury. And it's about an hour long when you go through all the vignettes and see if people really attached to watching things with individuals that makes them feel like they're not different. They're not so isolated to get to watch these. And you can watch those, that's up on the Office of Acquired Brain Injury website. So people can watch that at home and then they'll put up the information, the contact information, and people often will respond to that. 
There are also administrative items like databases or rules because the rules change each time of legislative session and we have to backtrack and, and bring people forward to what's going on now. So the committees provide an update to the advisory council at the official meetings, which again are once a quarter. We would do an entire day. We would do committee meetings in the morning and then a working lunch for my committee because I chaired that. And then we would do the council meeting from about one or 1.30 in the evening to when we gaveled out at five or 5.30, depending on how much business we had. We have to post our agenda with the secretary of state three weeks before the meeting, have to ask for an interpreter or whatever the needs are. So, and you cannot talk about anything in the meeting that's not on the agenda. There's one opportunity to do that. And that's when you ask for public comment at the end. So I'd have to say to people, you can only discuss these items that are in print. That way it's fair to everybody. There's public notice of what's going to be discussed. So when I took over as chair, I realized a lot of people felt very overwhelmed when they would come to meetings. So as a chair, I tried to do, I tried to be very welcoming as a survivor who had not had an ear for a long time. I tried to become that ear for the people that were willing to come to the meetings and learn to share this very private part about their life. And as Carol said, a lot of, it's a struggle when something is not your choice and you have to learn to deal with it. It makes people feel insecure and nervous about speaking out. So if I could welcome people and as the chair, make sure they knew that I wanted to hear what they had to say that did make a difference. So here's my, my rules for how I was chair. I was always ready. I always had a notebook, a pen, two pens, bottle of water. I was ready so that I had a little extra time when people would approach me. I was always organized in order of the agenda. I had my notes and my stuff and I I, didn't, and I had a timekeeper to make sure I stayed on track so that our time meeting did cover, but we did complete the agenda. Be flexible because you would have people talk to you about a story or about something that hadn't gone right. And I would have to know how to manage my time in there so that I could still step back into the meeting and run it. Be fair. Sometimes there's two sides to the story. Sometimes there would be upset people and it wasn't that they weren't heard. It's that the medical community had not found an answer for them and they would have a, a family member that was quite upset. So you have to, I could refer it back to the state, to the people that were appropriate and ask that they look at, at things. A good example might be the nursing home. To, if the survivor was in a, a care home asking that they take a look at the services that were being provided and answer the family members' questions. Be mindful of time, which I've already talked about. Make sure it's a courtesy because everybody that's come so far for a meeting has a right to a resolution. If we were going to have public comment about something, we needed to make sure we had time to do that. Be engaged, greet people, give them a card, be, uh, give them my phone number, be, be available. Uh, do follow up between meetings. I didn't just wait till the next meeting three months later. I would go home and go out into the community and write emails and share the committee members and be a member of another committee too and try to really stay engaged all the time, which is what the Office of Acquired Brain Injury encouraged the council to do so that there wasn't such a gap between what they did as part of their job and what we did on the council every three months. Uh, work in writing or documentation. It's really helpful for people to be able to take things on to refer to later. So if I needed to do that, I would write an email and, and copy in what I needed to to make sure they had the information. Uh, keep your language and your pages simple. A lot of people get very distracted or they're stressed by being in public and they don't follow very well because the committee meetings are very long. They get tired and that would be an opportunity to kind of break that down. And when I did a speech for the state of Tennessee years ago, they actually asked me not to bring any slides or anything. She said, your story is strong enough. Go ahead and talk, but let people focus on you. Let them hear what you have to say. Uh, a busy design or tiny text can be difficult when, from what the focus is. And you need to present in a way that's right for your audience. And again, I resigned as chair so I could advocate for the law and that has just passed, but I had a lot of a lot of good time on the council too. I felt like I was really contributing to something I had experienced. So I think next is Terry and the slide for our break. Terry, are you ready for that? Yes, I am. I was okay. just responding to. Um, we've had some great feedback. Thank you so much to this group, um, to the TBI 
advisory and leadership group, the TAL group, um, what we've learned from them is that it's important to give a break and it's something that we practice in our internal meetings um, and we're gonna do here. So we're gonna take, a, a, we didn't, I don't think we saw any questions. Maria, Judy, help me out or anyone else if you saw questions. Um, the recording slides and transcripts will be posted on the ACL website and I will send an email to everyone that registered and you will know when it's posted. Um, it'll be posted to YouTube. Um, but uh, Maria, Judy, anyone, Maria, do you see any I, other? Go ahead. I did not see any questions mm -hmm. that have not been answered. So I think we're good. Lots of great comments though. Okay, yep. yeah, great comments and a lot of great feedback to our TAL group members. Um, so we are gonna take a 10 minute break. We'll be back at 3.35. Um, so everyone, you know, take some time and, and also for our presenters, give them some time to kind of chill, get some water so that they can come back for the, the last hour. Um, so thank you. And we'll see you back at 3.36. Thank you. All right, time to get back um, from the break. Um, before we get started again, I, um, I wanted to say at the beginning, and I forgot to say that this presentation came about because um, we, the members of the TBI advisory and leadership group, the TAG group members, which you've been hearing from, um, we had them review a, a advisory board toolkit that the, the the work, work group of the TBISPP program had developed. And out of that, out of discussions, the um, members who are part of the presenters um, developed a document called Engagement Strategies for, Survivor, for Survivors, which is a companion piece to the advisory board toolkit. And that companion piece document, it's great. It's just some key key areas for being, you know, strategies for engaging. It's available on the ACA web, ACL website. I just posted the link. Um, and if you're interested in the toolkit that was developed by the ACL State Partnership Program Advisory Work Group, that is also on the ACL website. And I am about to post that link if it allows me. Um, so I just wanted to, to say that before we get going. Um, and then I want to move us to the next slide, um, and we're going to hear from Kelly Lang, who's going to talk about state and national events for engagement. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. I'm Kelly Lang. I'm a middle-aged white woman with brownish, blondish hair wearing a blue shirt. I'm sitting in a teal-colored room with a picture of the sunset at the beach behind me. I've been a person with lived experience as well as a caregiver to a child with a TBI for the past 20 years, and I live in Virginia. Um, you can go to the next slide. We've been talking a lot about stakeholder engagement today. This term can sometimes be confusing. I know it was for me in the beginning. In, the, in this case where we're talking about, stakeholders are those with brain injury, families and or caregivers, our involvement in advocacy helps other organizations learn about what our needs and desires are and how it fits in with their organization. These conversations foster connections, trust, and confidence for all of us. I was in a meeting recently that was comprised of four people with lived experience and one state program manager. Later, the manager mentioned how much she enjoyed listening to our conversation, discussing our concerns, about how it is to live with um, a brain injury. She told me later she learned so much about our lives, how we've been affected by brain injuries. Sometimes we don't realize we are educating or advocating others during our everyday conversations and every discussion has the potential to teach others. Our stories matter and bring relevance to the issues. As Carol and Cliff mentioned, there are numerous ways to engage. I'm gonna speak about some opportunities at the state and national levels. It may be intimidating to think about speaking at a higher level. I know it was for me. My advice is always to take it slowly. I learned this phrase from my daughter's teacher, break it down into chunks. You do not have to do it all the first time. Many state community providers send out requests to their consumers or members asking, them to contact legislators and urge them to just support a bill or a piece of legislation. It's intimidating to write a letter to your legislators, but there is assistance available if you need it. Usually a pre-worded request can be tailored to include why that issue is important to you. 
for instance, if it's something about housing and you know someone who that is an important issue for, or you think it might be in the future, tailor it to how it affects you and your family. If there isn't a pre-worded, ask for it. There is nothing wrong with asking for the things we need. I know I have a hard time asking. Agencies look for stakeholders to speak on their behalf during budget hearings. Take advantage of these. Staff members are more than happy to assist anyone who may not be comfortable speaking to legislators by themselves. Personal stories are impactful and can help others understand the needs of the brain injury community. I participated in one of these this past year and it was impactful to hear what others share and what their stories and why these programs are essential to them or their family member. Going into these with a few people takes the pressure off as well. This helps build your skills and over time it will become much easier. If your state has a brain injury day, try to attend. This can be hard for those who do not live near the state capitol, but some organizations can charter buses to take a group which will make it easier. And in this era of Zoom meetings, as Carol mentioned before, virtual sessions take away the transportation issue and can be much easier to access for some people. At these events, talk to others with lived experience. This is a great way to learn about other programs and other opportunities for advocacy. Brain Injury Awareness Day, usually held in March during Brain Injury Awareness Month, is another way to get involved. The events held in Washington, D.C., and again, can be difficult for a lot of people to attend. Over the years, I had heard a lot about it, but for many reasons did not attend. It's a long day, but provides a wonderful way to advocate for brain injury, meet other advocates, and get additional resources. If your state organization is participating, you can ask to join them on their visits to legislatures, or you can set up your own visits. There's a vendor fair that provides great resources, and connects you with others who either work in the field of brain injury or are survivors themselves. The day includes a panel who addresses attendees in various areas of brain injury, and these can be quite informative. Cheryl spoke at the last in-person event in 2020. At the end of the day, there's a reception which provides another opportunity to meet others and learn about resources and opportunities. I'm hoping this event will be able to be in person again sometime soon. Finally, ACL Stakeholder Day. The first time I heard about this day was in 2017. I didn't know what ACL did, but I knew they were going to discuss brain injury, so I figured it was a way for me to learn more. The day was planned with panels filled with speakers who either had an injury, a family member, a caregiver, or a state or national program personnel. At first, it was a bit overwhelming, to say the least. I walked in <clears throat> to a room filled with mostly people I didn't know, the speakers were talking about policy, which was interesting, but can be a little dry. Um, and once a brain injury survivor spoke, my attention was piqued. As the day went on, others I knew came in and later panels included multiple perspectives. It was a great way to hear what other states were working on, where resources were robust and where they were not. It made a lot of connections that day. As we talked about earlier, ACL has expanded this day over the past few years and is dedicated to making it more inclusive for those with lived experience. This year, some of us participated in the virtual program. If you have difficulty finding opportunities, ask. Talk to support group leaders, case managers, state program specialists, doctors, and most of all, your fellow survivors who can suggest ways to get involved. It can be easy to feel discouraged after a brain injury. If, you, if your first experience doesn't go as well as you would like, keep trying. With practice, we improve and find our right niche. Cliff is going to discuss graduating to leading others and peer-to-peer -peer support. Thank you, Kelly. My video should be coming on. There it is. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out to S.A. HSRI, um, because I don't know if it was a year or so ago, Nasha was having a conference. And um, part of being a leader is finding out what's going on in the rest of the country. And so I tried to attend the conference. And unfortunately, there wasn't any openings for people that um, were not providers. But HSRI reached out to me and said, you know what, we think you, your story has a lot to offer. So we want you to get involved in us. And, and 
thanks to um, Terry and her organization, they reached out to me and that's how I got this opportunity. Next slide. So I wanna thank them very much. These are different leadership strategies. Most of them I'm sure you're aware of, but we'll just go over them anyway. Building trust is the foundation for leading others. Bring positive energy and willingness to listen. Ensure people can count on you. Encourage people to believe in a better future. Have a common bond of lived experience with those who are using services. I try and take this, these strategies and use them every day. I now am a member of the New York State Traumatic Brain Injury Services Coordinating Council, and I'm very grateful for that. One of the ways that I tried to use my leadership was to encourage New York State to have Nasha come and do a presentation. Previously, there was never any interest, and I'm very grateful that this September, the executive director of Nasha is going to be doing a presentation at the New York State Traumatic Brain Injury Service Coordinating Council meeting. That's a major step. It really is. And, you know, it's really important to remain positive. One of the things that I felt helps me get by is that I appreciate what I have and I don't regret what I don't have. And when I'm a peer mentor working with people, I try and give them, through my experience, how things can change. And it's really important to use lived experience. And another way that I'm trying to use my leadership is I reached out to New York State Department of Mental Health, who I work for. And I said, you know, the mental health community doesn't recognize people with traumatic brain injury. And I, I said, I don't understand that. How could you have a head injury and not have trauma and have mental health? And they said to me, well, people in the, who receive mental health services were born with a disability. They don't acquire it. But yet I kept talking to them and I got the deputy commissioner to come do a presentation at the last TBI service coordinating council meeting about how mental health has a, T a peer mentoring program and how it could help the TBI community. And so I'm gonna follow through on this because I really believe that leading is by making greater opportunities for people to be involved. Next slide. We talked about speaking from experience like everybody's doing on here. Educating other disabled groups have TBI. Perfect example is when I go to different mental health organizations and I explain to them about my lived experience, they now say, wow, I think I have somebody in my community that could use your assistance. And so I'm encouraging people to make referrals to the organization I work at so that I can work with them. Because as a peer specialist, we give that extra layer of support that they may not get from any place else. And I'll tell you, I wish that I had a mentor when I was going through these challenges. I guess my mentor was Beth Ganazio, who runs the TBI waiver, and she's so supportive. Um, unfortunately, my family lives out of state, and I'm really on my own. Um, and I, that's another reason why I feel it's important to learn who is in the community. And here are some resources I encourage you to take a look at. Um, so thank you very much. And Carol, you're next. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody, for participating. Carol, I believe you're next. Yes, I think you got a couple more slides to, to, you, um, to go through there. My apologies. Next slide. I thought about this idea for peer mentoring. I reached out, like I told you, I reached out to the Department of Mental Health, and she did some research. And one of our members of this group is Maria, um, Maria who lives in Colorado, Maria Martinez. And she introduced me to Zach Hudson. And he told me about the program that they offer in Colorado. Mentoring is a process of semi-structured guidance, therefore, thereby the mentor shares their knowledge, skills, and experience to assist the peer. Mentorship is peer-centered. Next slide. Increased community integration and independence. These are the benefits. Increased confidence with communication, interpersonal skills, and perceived social support. Increased satisfaction with life and self-empowerment. Decreased isolation. If nothing else, COVID has taught us about isolation. And I find it really challenging. And that's why I look for opportunities like this to be involved because I can't find people in my local community. And so we're gonna go to the next slide. 
I'm going to give you some examples of other states that have peer programs. Texas, through the Brain Injury Network of Dallas. Next slide. Georgia, through the Behavioral Health Department. Next slide. Okay, Carol, thanks for helping me out there and you're next, bye. Hi again. So I am going to talk about finding opportunities to engage. If you're a survivor and you say, well, I wanna get involved, but, but how, how do I find these, these blades? How, how do I do this? So I'm gonna take a slightly unusual tack to talking about this topic. And I'm gonna start by telling you one of my mottos. And one of my mottos since my brain injury is start small, find success and build on it. During Kelly's presentation, she kind of alluded to it and what she was talking about, about, about starting small. And I think that this applies to learning to live with brain injury. And it also applies to how do we find these opportunities to engage? How do we get involved? How do we find survivors who want to be involved? As brain injury survivors, many of us, we become all too familiar with failure because we, a lot of us, we try to go back to our old lives and tasks that were easy at one, at one time are now difficult, if not outright impossible. And we just encounter closed door after closed door. And I know from my own experience in the early years after my injury, when I experienced failure after failure, that just, it sends self-confidence, it sends self-esteem just plummeting right to rock bottom. And failure, it makes us doubt ourselves. It makes us wonder, are we capable of doing anything at all? So what does that have to do with my topic here, finding opportunities to engage? Well, I could sit here and I could talk about all the, all the, the places survivors can engage, like boards and committees and mentoring and, and presenting, and, but various people, we've, we've already kind of covered all of, of those. So instead, what I'm talking about are some of the, qu the qualities of opportunities, because I think that's an important factor to consider. If you're a survivor who's looking to get involved, if you're a board or a committee member who's looking to provide opportunities for survivors to get involved, that we have to focus on what is it that we can do? Because when we focus on what we can do, that's when we have success. And that's when success can grow from small things into bigger things. I want to share a couple of stories of my own successes or some things, some one story that where things went really well and one story where they didn't go so well. Um, my very first advocacy effort, it was about maybe three years ish um, after my injury. It was a time when I'm in the state of Maine, when there was um, concerned that the, the, legislator was, the legislature was going to cut brain injury services for brain, um, for brain injury. And there was a lot of um, work being done around that. People were going out to the state house. They were, they were going to be knocking on legislators, legislators' doors and, and all these sorts of things that at that point in my journey was just impossible. That even though there were buses that were going, at that point, I couldn't be on a bus with the people because of my sound sensitivity. It was an hour and a half ride. I would have been a puddle by the time I got there. I think it was my occupational therapist who helped me to reframe what I couldn't do into thinking about, well, what can I do? And what I could do for that was I could write a letter. So I did. I wrote a letter to the governor. I got a response back. And that, that, that law did not pass um, because of all of that effort of, of many people, not only myself. Um, but it was my first experience of that success of focusing what I could do to, to make a difference. Then many years later, this was when the Brain Injury Voices group that my mentor and I founded, we were maybe like a year or so old. And um, my mentor invited somebody who was involved in, in brain injury at the national level to come and speak to us. 
And I think this person was excited because here were 10 people who wanted to be involved in, 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 in the brain injury community. And we were here, she spoke to us like 10 feet above where we were as a group. As a group at that point, we'd done a couple of presentations, we'd done a little bit of mentoring. We were proud of what we had done. But she was talking at us like we were here, like we were ready to be engaged at the national level, all this stuff. And I'll tell you, it took the wind out of our sails because all of a sudden we felt def defeated, like we hadn't done enough. Like, why are we bothering with what we're doing when there's all this other stuff to be done? And it, and I, it took quite a while to recover from that, that it wasn't a successful experience, that yes, we need, it's, it's important to grow, but we need to grow in those small chunks because that was just um, way too far above our heads. So I do have some advice. If you're a brain injury survivor and you do wanna get involved, but you have no idea where to start, I've identified, well, what are some steps that you can take that over time can grow from small successes into bigger successes? Next slide, please. First thing is, if you haven't already, join, every, join any email list that you're interested in that find out what's happening in the brain injury community through your local brain injury um, organization, um, through the National Association or Alliance. There's also the Model Systems Knowledge Translation Center. If you don't know about that, they often will look for survivors who will test out the handouts that they create for, for brain injury survivors, that opportunities can come simply through being on email lists. I can count quite a number of opportunities that have come my way simply because I was on an email list and I responded to something looking for survivors who are interested in this. Next slide, please. Show up. If there are events in your state, go. If, you, if you're able to, you don't, you don't even have to go to the entire event. Just go to whatever piece of an event that you can go to and meet people. That could be a brain injury, injury support group that I talked about earlier your state brain injury conference, if your state has a resource fair, if there are fundraisers, that the more people that you meet within the community, the more, the more chances that there will be opportunities to get involved because you never know when meeting one person will lead to meeting another person and will lead to something else. I mean, Cheryl talked about that in her presentation earlier during this webinar, the importance of, of meeting people. Next slide, please. Talk to other brain injury survivors. That it was key for me in my journey early on to learn from others, to learn from survivors who had been at this much longer than I have. How'd you do it? I remember looking at my mentor and you know, she had written a book. She was doing speeches. She was involved in all of these things. It's like, and I, and I hadn't, hadn't done any of that stuff yet. How did you do that? And we would talk about that and talk about her steps. Her steps were not exactly my steps, but they gave me ideas. And now I've done all the things that she had done too. Um, that as survivors, we can learn from one another, that none of us have to, to do this alone, that we are, are a community. Next slide, please. Social media has become a wonderful place to get involved in the brain injury community. Kelly mentioned uh, Brain Injury Awareness Day. That's actually the first place that I learned about Brain Injury Awareness Day was from a brain injury group on Facebook. So that if you are on Facebook, just type in brain injury. You'll be amazed at what comes up. If you're on LinkedIn, create a profile as a brain injury survivor, as an advocate, and friend others within the community. There are brain injury survivors on Twitter. We are we're all over the place. And that it is an opportunity to, to meet people and to meet others like across the country. Next slide, please. This is all about, about taking a risk, 
about you know, raising one's hand and saying, yes, I wanna be involved. You know, if you're at a conference, you know, ask a question, go up to the speaker afterwards and talk to them. If there are opportunities that are doable for you, volunteer, because this is how engagement grows. This is how you start small, find success and build on it. That you have no idea where those small actions can lead you to. Next slide, please. That, and then these are my kind of my general advice strategies that finding opportunities is about being open to trying something new. That even though it might be a little bit scary, maybe to go to a conference, to go to a support group, to raise your hand, it's okay. It's all right to try something new, to push just a little bit past one's comfort zone and to know that, yes, you're probably gonna need strategies um, to, ha to have success. There might be some resting on the couch that's required afterwards, that's okay. But as Kelly was mentioning earlier, we keep trying just a little bit at a time and those opportunities, they, they can indeed come. Next slide. And this slide is my advice for program staff and community providers who are looking to engage with brain injury survivors. How do you make it easier for us? One of my recommendations is to break tasks down, that to be specific about what is it that, that you would like us to do, that it's easier to say yes to something when you know exactly what is, is required then. We're looking for survivors to serve on a committee. Well, I don't know, can I do that with my injury? I'm not sure. But when I know more about well, what the time frame is, what the commitment is, then it makes it, e make it easy for us to say yes, because we know and we can judge whether our brain injuries are, or whether it's capable or not. Use mentors. Um, several of us have talked about the importance of mentors that, if you're on a committee and you have somebody who's your mentor, if it's challenging, if you feel lost, then you have that person to go to. Because as survivors, many of us struggle with that feeling of less than. Um, that you know, you're in a group, a committee, and with quote, normal, normal people, and you feel like you can't keep up, you feel like you're lost. When you have somebody who is your mentor to talk to, they can help you turn that, that feeling of failure into a feeling of success. And think about, well, how do you make this experience into a success for the brain injury survivor? Because that's knowing not only what your board needs, but also what the survivor needs from the experience. Because so many of us, we've lost our, our, our former lives. So forming, um, being on these boards, it's about more than just whatever the board is. This is, this is very meaningful to us. So figuring out what we, what we need helps, helps to make it a success. So those are some of my, my recommendations. So Kelly is now gonna talk about, about staying engaged. Yes, <clears throat> thanks Carol. So we've been talking a lot about um, engagement today and engagement has become a popular topic, especially since there's now a requirement through the grant program that state advisory board membership consists of 50% of those with lived experience. Next slide. So I'll share a little story. When I was, um, it was after my injury and um, I thought I was fully healed um, and I joined a board. It was an organization that my children were involved in and I thought, oh, I have some extra time I can participate. And it was an absolute disaster. I was not ready. I did not have the skills built up of how to fully engage in this board. And so I ended up leaving. And over the over time, I started taking opportunities in little groups and built up my skills again until where I, um, I've been able to fully engage. Now, um, finding these opportunities once we find the opportunities, it's hard to, to stay engaged because it can be overwhelming, but with time and persistence, we can grow into a new role. First, I wanna 
I divided it up into engagement for the survivors. And then afterwards, we'll talk about what the um, state advisory boards can do to help us survivors. But for the survivors, learn as much as you can during those first meetings. It's overwhelming, especially if you haven't had any experience with most of the members. Take your time. It's a marathon, not a sprint. If you're not ready to commit to a full meeting and all that's involved, ask if you can just come and observe as, an, as, a, um, as a member, just see if you can, or join a committee. Some of the groups don't require membership to work on a committee. Once you do decide to commit, either as a full member or in a subcommittee, prepare. Preparation is the number one. You have to stay organized. Know where to access agendas, minutes, committee information. Find a system that's gonna work for you. It may take time trying to determine which system that will be. Some prefer digital files, some prefer paper, some like both or a combination. Find whatever works for you and, and use it. Be aware of the challenges you're, gonna, you're going to encounter regarding your injury. If you get tired after sitting for an extended time, take movement breaks. I mean, as Terry explained, that was one of the things we brought into this group is, um, is putting those breaks in. We need them. Plan your week so you're not busy the day before a meeting or the day after. Give yourself time to rest. Prepare when and how you will share your story. It is not always appropriate. Conversations may bring up grief or uncomfortable, uncomfortable feelings, and that is normal. Take a break or speak to someone afterwards to process those feelings. Remember, you may not always need to do those things. When I joined the Brain Injury Association of Virginia's board, I had to drive three hours each way. That was a lot of driving for me in one day. I knew I would be exhausted the next day, so I made sure my schedule was clear. I also tried to take it easy the day before. Over time, this wasn't such a difficult task, and now when I attend meetings that far away, I actually enjoy the ride. Know yourself. It's probably one of the big, big things. And unfortunately for us survivors, it's hard to let go of the person you were prior and embrace the person you are now, but embrace that person. Identify where you're able to contribute. No one expects you to volunteer for every set subcommittee or every event. Evaluate your talents and use them to help the organization. Once you've attended a few meetings, think about where your contributions will add most to the mission. If you're unable to figure that out, what your skills are, reach out to someone who may be able to help you. Many times others see things in ourselves that we don't ne necessarily recognize, both positive and negative. Over time, your interests and skills may pull you into a different direction you never imagined. Take a chance, it's okay. Accommodations, beware of any accommodations you may need to fully engage in meetings. Do you need plain language documents? larger typeface, more breaks, an aid, or anything else. If you have sensory issues, inquire about the meeting room, lighting. Do you need transportation assistance? There isn't anything wrong with asking for accommodations. Advisory boards com committees have missions that encompass many areas of brain injury. Be prepared. No one ex will expect you to be an expert at everything. Ask questions. Conversely, you must be open to new ideas. Try not to focus on only one area. If you have worked to provide more housing opportunities for those living with brain injury, do not join a board only for that issue. Be open to new ideas and new ways to engage. And it's also important to, to reflect on your experience, to know your abilities and recognize which meetings, tasks, or environments might be a good fit for you. We don't all enjoy the same activities. We don't all perform well in the same environments. If you're concerned and wanna leave the group, talk with someone on the board first. Boards can benefit from your feedback. Give yourself permission to say no. This is a big one, especially for me. I admit it. There might be other groups that are a better fit for you. We all make mistakes, which is a part of life, but I encourage you to keep striving and looking forward. There's a need for your experience and you will find a good avenue to share it with others. Next slide. So this is um, engagement for the TBI state program staff and community providers. And I have this picture here of a highway because I feel that it's almost a convergence because it's the 
survivors and the program staff and we have to kind of meet and we kind of sometimes we have to go over each other and under each other but we're all merging with the same goal in mind um, our goals align and we may have to cross over at the intersections but the result is helping all those affected by brain injury the structures of meetings may need to be altered to allow for full participation I was in a meeting right recently and John Corrigan, an Ohio researcher and director of the Ohio, Ohio Valley Center for Brain Injury Prevention and Rehab, suggested using the principles of universal design. He explained that everyone benefits from uh, meeting design, get using breaks, better lighting, having pre-meetings and other accommodation. It doesn't only benefit the person with lived experience, it benefits the entire group. Have an interview um, application process. Be honest when interviewing and vetting new members. Describe the requirements, develop a process. One group I work with, we came up with an application for, for prospective members to complete if they were interested in joining. It is a good way to ascertain if an individual is ready. Help if the individual has difficulty with the technical aspects. Once you bring on new members, provide some sort of orientation to the group, do it as a group, or you can do it individually if needed. Explain the meeting protocols, provide a schedule, times and locations, and a Zoom link if necessary. Clarify when meeting materials will be provided, ideally a week in advance. Distribute a membership list. Before the meeting, provide a pre-meeting for those who may require background information on the agenda. Discuss accommodations. At the first meeting, welcome the new member. Allow them time to introduce themselves to the group and explain what brought them there. Make them feel welcome more than anything. As Carol was mentioning, a mentorship program is key. Assign another member to serve as their mentor for a year. This mentor can serve as their go-to person to answer questions. The mentor can be a support system and should check in on a regular basis to ensure things are going well and provide the support that is requested if possible. In another group we're in, um, we developed a mentoring program and the individuals who were part of that, the new group that came in, said that the having a mentor was the best. They had one person to go to if they had a question or a problem or, and it just provided such an easy avenue. Do a regular check-in. It helps if someone else on the executive committee or the chair reaches out after a meeting and asks how it went or if they had any further information to provide after processing the meeting. Sometimes a person with lived experience may have difficult time responding to items at the meeting, their processing speed, but afterwards have more thoughts to share. So it is a good idea to have an open opportunity to discuss these. Be attentive to newer members. Do they look overwhelmed? Approach them during a break or afterwards and ask how it's going. Sometimes it's hard for a person with lived experience to feel their contribution is valuable. Ask if they have questions or if they're familiar with a the topic, they may be more willing to share. Engagement is not a one-way street. It is a highway of participation from all sides. Merging, let's work together to ensure success for all parties involved. And I'll hand it back to you, Terry. Thank you, Kelly. That was great. Um, there were so many great um, comments and feedback, and we could see there was a lot of um, interaction and people getting together and um, making connections. So that's great. Um, Maria, Judy, I think there was, Maria, you told me there was one question um, and any one of the panelists, if you can turn all your, um, I don't know, get rid of this. Well, the one question that we saw is how can a person with TBI engage themselves through Zoom? Anyone wanna take that question? And some of you have some really good tips and tricks for managing Zoom that you have used in some of our meetings. Thank you, Carol. Looks like, are you gonna say something? <laughs> I guess I would, I need more information in, in Zoom in a support group, Zoom in a meeting. I'm guessing you, about the context, but I am assuming that they mean, you know, it, is it possible to feel engaged when you're networking and in meetings virtually? 
Does that help? Yes. In, I, th I think yes. I mean, I have several meetings that we're, we're only Zoom because we are across the country so that we're, we're not going to be, um, that we, we do have, we do make, make um, cause Kelly, Kelly, you're, you're part of these meetings too. Um, yes. That I think some of it is, is having conversation is, is not just all about the, whatever the agenda is, but getting to know people as real people not just boxes on the screens is where boxes on the screen it's it's hard and I think facilitation is so much more important on zoom because there's video lag so you know when somebody raises their hand it's, it's hard to see well who raised their hand first and you have to be much more um, attentive to to that um, and to think about well how how are you going to how are you going to talk how are you going to um, answer questions. Um, do, do you want to do actual hand raising like in the in the um, the support group that I because we were we were on we've been on Zoom since the pandemic, and we decided that we we wanted to leave our um, videos not on mute because when somebody said something funny, yes we could see each other laughing, but we couldn't hear each other laughing, and that was really strange. We decided that we liked the 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 hearing each other laughing. That if, some, if there was noise in somebody's background, yes, they needed to mute. And as the facilitator, I would mute somebody fast if their phone rang or if a dog was barking or something like that. But we wanted to keep the interaction as normal you know, as, as possible. Yeah, if others have, have any other suggestions. Thank you, Carol. Anyone else? Someone says we should have this two hour panel in one hour for questions. <laughs> um, Cliff, your camera may not be working, but do you want to unmute yourself and say something? Yeah, I think that what's really important about Zoom is make sure you have the right time. Because as you get involved with other organizations that are out of state, they're not necessarily always on this time, same time <laughs> schedule. So that was it. That was a little tricky for me at the beginning when I started participating out of state events because it was on a different time frame, and especially I travel a lot, so I had to remember what what I was in at the time. And so I think that's the thing I would really suggest you do so you make it on time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cliff. Anyone else want to add anything? If we don't have uh, any questions, um, any questions coming in? I want to, we have a, at the end, we kind of an evaluation question and we just want to see what worked, what, did, you know, what we can improve on for future TBI TARC, um webinars. So unless there's any more questions, then I'm going to move to the next slide. Thank you. And I want to thank all the presenters. Um, this was great. And I, it, it people were, were really excited about this. Um, we just now want to, people to take a few minutes to respond to six questions um, to help us better deliver high quality TBI TARC webinars. And as we noted earlier too, so um, you should be able to see the poll now, I think. I have, I'm not seeing anyone responding, but you can, if you can go on and respond to the questions, um, that would be greatly appreciated. I don't know if it was launched. Um, and of course, if you have any questions or suggestions about how we might be able to improve future TBI TARC webinars, or if you have ideas or requests for future webinar topics, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Are people seeing the, the survey, the poll? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Because I'm not seeing that people are responding. So that's why um, I wasn't sure, but. Hopefully people are, re oh, there it goes. People are responding, okay. Don't, don't be shy, please respond. And, and as our people are responding, I just wanna um, go to the next slide, um, just kind of keep us going. Is there a next slide? 
So um, on the slide are the questions that uh, we, we are asking you about. I don't need to read them. Um, is there another slide? Um, and just kind of some of the reminders. So, so here at the end, we have bios for the presenters. We did not include email addresses, but um, I think some of them share their email addresses through, through chat. Um, and as Shaska noted, tomorrow, you, within 24 hours of this webinar ending, you're gonna get a link to the recording and it will have the chat. So you will see everything that went into the chat. And then you can also use, use that as a confirmation that you attended this webinar. Um, so we're not gonna send out a certificate, but it's a, um, a confirmation. The webinar recording, the PDF, which is now available, the slides, and then um, some other, maybe the transcript will be uploaded to the ACL, the Administration for Community Living website. And once that is available, I will send out an email to everyone that register for this conference. So you will get the link to the recording um, that it's posted on the Administration for Community Web, um, Living website. And please feel free to share um, that link. We are more than happy for other people to get to um, experience this great webinar. Um, and so I think that's it. We, some people are still responding to the, to the um, poll questions. We can end the slides. Oh, I don't even have my video on, I'm sorry. But <laughs> um, I was just kind of reading. And again, we wanna thank you all um, in a reminder that the Traumatic Brain Injury Technical Assistance and Resource Center, the TBI TARC is funded by the Administration for Community Living. Um, and we put on two webinars a year. So please email us um, if you wanna give us some suggestions of, of future topics. We've shared links on documents that we've already created through the um, center and um, thank you. And this is um, the end and I wanna thank all the, the speakers today or our members of Atal Group and Maria and Judy for giving us a nice overview at the beginning. Um, thank you and have a good day. And you have seven minutes um, unless any questions came in. Um, and if not, thank you. And we can end the poll now. <laughs>